Miss your voice, miss your smile. Everything about you worth the while. Good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew. This is Greg. Um, <laughs> I believe Greg just wrote a book. Um, <laughs> and it's not uh, Muppets in Moscow, which is, we're kind of disappointed it's not, but uh, thank you for showing up anyway. It sounds like a good book. So, you know, Greg and I talked earlier in this week, we figured um, it would be a conversation between he and I, and then there would be some time uh, for questions at the end, and so we figured, um, uh, given uh, we're in the the home of where cemeteries really truly began in the country, um, just down the street at Mount Auburn 191 years ago, that it would be prudent to start there. So, Greg, tell us how Mount Auburn fits into the story of cemeteries in the United States. Sure, I, I, hopefully I'll do it justice. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, uh, how we perceive of burial grounds today was is largely a result of the creation of Mount Auburn. Uh, back in the early 19th century, Mount Auburn essentially untethered burial grounds from churchyards and family burial plots, uh, and also um, kind of innovated the idea in some respects of the American concept of everybody gets a trophy in death, everyone gets a grave and a gravestone, um, which is so important. Uh, because before that, if you take uh, like Granary Burying Ground in, in Boston, it was a place that was literally overflowing with bodies where there were thousands and thousands of people buried and a handful of gravestones. And it got to the point where in urban cemeteries in the United States and, uh, and, and also overseas, where the overcrowding was so bad that Burial reform was kind of really high on the agenda of a lot of cities uh, due to public health reasons, and and um, and also grave robbing was a problem. And then here comes Mount Auburn, this cemetery that, like I said, untethers from uh, a place of worship and becomes, as when it was created, a garden of graves. So it was essentially the first city park uh, in the United States. It was essentially the birthplace of landscape architecture as well, and an inspiration for so many uh, burial grounds that were created shortly thereafter in cities across the uh, Out of five. All right. <laughs> Very few people know Mount Auburn was really the first large-scale publicly designed landscape in the country, right? It really is has received landmark status because it was the original that has informed other cemeteries, Really, all public landscapes in uh, the country, you know. And when I, you know, I'm out there talking to the the world about Mount Auburn, you know, for people who have been, I, I usually ask, well, what do you what do you remember from your first visit? And I hear the trees, the tower, an owl, you know, all sorts of things um, that are specific to our very special place. Greg, what do you remember from your first visits to Mount Auburn? The birds. <laughs> uh, because uh, Mount Auburn is essentially on the Atlantic Flyway, it is an amazing place, in, especially in the month of May, for these birds that come from Central and South America on their way to their summer homes in New England. And it is amazing, I did a bird watching tour, and uh, it's amazing the, the birds that you see there and, and just how alive, uh, to, to be ironic there, uh, how alive uh, Mount Auburn really is. <clears throat> You know, I actually met with someone from Massachusetts Audubon uh, Society earlier this week, and they told me that even something that I didn't know, that you know, Mount Auburn, more species of birds have been identified at Mount Auburn than some of their, than all, you know, than their best Audubon sites uh, in the state. And I think it's, you know, when you look down at Mount Auburn from a map, you know, you see this uh, sort of gray tapestry with this sort of green heart uh, of uh, 175 acres of Mount Auburn at the core. So inevitably we are an active cemetery and we intend to be an active cemetery for hundreds of years uh, into the future. Um, but you know, I, I do know cemeteries uh, can make people feel a little bit nervous or uh, uneasy. What has been you know, your experience with 
uh, visiting many cemeteries across the country and this concept of they, they make, sometimes they make some people feel really uncomfortable. Yeah, and so it seems like um, part of the purpose of this book is to kind of demystify, right? To show how cemeteries are kind of like the, the Forrest Gump of American history, always appearing in different places, uh, actually playing a role in shaping American history in so many ways, just like Mud Auburn has, uh, obviously. Uh, and in a lot of cases today, uh, cemeteries, because they are competing for the attention of people and, and for people's choices for, for, for death, um, they have become much more community oriented than say at the end of the, the 20th century. So they are kind of going back to their roots of being places where like Hollywood Forever Cemetery in Los Angeles where you take a date um, or get married. <laughs> or um, yeah, Hollywood Forever has movie nights and uh, and they have concerts there and everything and and so uh, if you go to Congressional Cemetery in uh, Washington D.C. they have a fenced in it's largely fenced in and so if you're a member of the Friends of Congressional Cemetery in the mornings it's a giant dog run uh, and and so there's this massive waiting list to be a member at Congressional Cemetery so you. Can so cemeteries are really kind of demystifying death, uh, bringing the community back into these spaces like Mount Auburn, which was the second largest, uh, most popular tourist attraction in the early 19th century after Niagara Falls, and uh, kind of going back to, uh, to use another uh, pun, going back to their roots. Yeah, you know, I think we take places like you know public public open space, public landscapes for granted. You know, back in two hundred years ago, right, it wasn't as common as it is now for the urban experience, right. And so, what's sort of fascinating to me, I'm new to the world, newish to the world of cemeteries, and you know, one of the things I sort of keep thinking about over the next fifty years, hundred years, uh, well, people are going to keep dying number one, right? I think that's safe to say. Um, and inevitably, there are these places of commemoration that are feeling sort of pinched by the world around them as we, you know, as they get fuller, but also the spaces around them continue to get fuller too. Can you, you know, can you speak to like, well, you know, as we start to think about cemeteries evolving into the future, what does the cemetery of the future look like? Facebook. <laughs> uh, Can you tell us more about that? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I say that, and that's, that's partly why um, cemeteries have been so proactive about embracing communities, because it seems like the future, I, I, I can't predict the future, and if I did, I'd buy lots of lottery tickets, or that almanac that Biff had <laughs> that, that um, would allow me to, to bet on sports. but. Um, it seems like the future of cemeteries is analog. Um, and because to compete, and, and they have to find their own community niche that way, because um, if you think of a cemetery as being a place that captures the essence of who we are, then Facebook is the largest cemetery in the world. They have 30 million people who are no longer living, and they think that in 50 years there'll be more dead people on Facebook than living. Um, and Facebook can carry obviously a lot more data than a gravestone can. Uh, so there has to, so cemeteries are now finding ways like, um, and, and, uh, like Mount Auburn or, or, or other places to connect with the community so that it's a place where people want to be forever, basically. And, and so I, I see that as really being, um, from my own humble perspective, perch, that that is really kind of the future of Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I wholly agree, right? You know, uh, we are spending a great deal of time thinking about Mount Auburn and sort of planning Mount Auburn as a place for life just as much as it's a place for death. And that it can be a place that is your darkest of saddest days, but can somehow also be a place you go on your happiest of joyful days. And you know, those dualities um, existing simultaneously in the same place are sort of fascinating to me, right? That um, 
you know, the same place can serve both of those purposes. And, and um, a couple of weeks ago, I was actually at a get together of other, maybe a dozen people who run cemeteries. And that is a very reoccurring theme among all of us uh, who are trying to balance this um, place for death, but also a place for, for life. And you know, we're each uh, sort of striving for uh, finding experiences or components of that that are authentic to us. You know, for Mount Auburn, you know, because the landscape um, is such a critical piece of the experience and was really intended to be a critical piece of uh, from our founders you know, almost 200 years ago, you know, I think that is really a core piece of what is driving our thinking about how does the landscape part of this um, balance of life and death and uh, sorrow and happiness. Uh, so Greg, what, one of the items that I also get asked frequently is about the different types of disposition methods that exist, right? So um, over the last couple decades, um, there is not just the traditional casket burial, uh, there are different options that are starting to uh, be readily available or legislated or that uh, consumers are asking for. Um, you know, tell us like how the book interprets this sort of evolution of, of change in disposition methods over the years. Sure, so um, basically the, the book takes a chronological approach starting in um, Jamestown uh, and then working its way into modern uh, natural burial grounds uh, and kind of everywhere in between from uh, Burial Hill in Plymouth to uh, Concord, uh, Sleepy Hollow there, which is kind of, uh, in a lot of ways, the first uh, conservation area. Uh, it was created by um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, basically, with help from Henry David Thoreau. Um, I go to uh, New York City and even kind of profile Central Park, which is probably the city's largest active graveyard right now because of cremations, um, Arlington and Gettysburg, and. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address was essentially a speech to open up the cemetery that was created there. And when he gave the Gettysburg Address, he was redefining the good death uh, in America because people were grasping to understand the meaning behind these grisly uh, casualties that were taking place in war and whether or not their, their loved ones would reach salvation if they died namelessly. Uh, on a battlefield, and so that was really important. It was a pivotal shift. Arlington was a political animal created basically to flip the bird at Robert E. Lee, whose property it was on. Um, you know, and then you get to more modern times. Uh, I, I, I write about um, the Chapel of the Chimes, uh, which is a columbarium basically in um, in Oakland, which uh, so it has literally thousands of cremated remains stored in it, and. It was created by the, the architect who did uh, William Randolph Hearst's castle. And she basically did it in the early 20th century. And her goal was to make it uh, take uh, cremation from seeming like something that's atheistic to being holy. And so she modeled this place after this, this building uh, after a, a medieval Spanish church, basically. And so then you get to today, it's, it's constantly changing, right? And now we have. Uh, natural burial grounds, and my wife always threatening to mulch me, uh, uh, which is actually a thing. Um, uh, so, but so I'm, I'm I'm writing things down very strictly. Uh, but um, uh, so so there's uh, you know, obviously the, the the huge trend toward cremation, which has outpaced burials, and then these natural options because people are concerned about cost, and then also about uh, their their environmental footprint. Sure. It's not legislated in uh, Massachusetts, but it's called organic production, you know, where you can be composted. You know, it's a process that takes about 30 days. There's a machine that um, produces a little bit of heat and sort of turns uh, you and the starter, and eventually <laughs> you end up as uh, soil. Uh, a, for most people who want their final action to be one of regenerative, right? You know, so that's that sort of sends a message that's um, sort of go 
going back into literally the atoms that you came from. You know, uh, in in Massachusetts, uh, there are tr traditional casket burials, cremation, and uh, green burial, natural burial. You know, are really the three options that exist today. You know, Mount Auburn is intending to sort of start conversations to uh, expand. You know, uh, access for whatever our families uh, desire. But we do know cremation is really the the largest, most popular option he, uh, here, it varies regionally. Some places of the country caskets are still more popular, some places, you know, cremation in general across the country is really the most popular disposition method. And green burial are sort of continuing to grow in uh, popularity, but it is sort of a, a slower, and, and green burial is really, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, sort of full circle of coming back to how Mount Auburn used to inter people, where instead of a fancy casket or a liner, you know, you really just go into the grounds with a you know, flowers or a simple shroud or a simple pine box, um, you know, really very you no know, frills. And you know, one of the reasons that I think that has gained in some level of popularity, because over the years, um, these casket burials specifically. Uh, there's a lot of accessories that people don't understand go with that that make it um, safe really for wherever those cemeteries are and so there's a lot of concrete and steel that goes in the ground that most people are really unaware of um, and sort of a startling statistic that you know if you were to add up all of the casket burials in the United States in a single year you know, the amount of concrete and steel that's used by just those casket burials for one year, you know, you could build the Golden Gate Bridge twice over. And so all of that's sort of getting buried, you know, in the ground in all 50 states, right? And I, and I think there is this like resounding, well, wait a minute, how did, how did this come to be uh, over, you know, slowly bit by bit by decade? And there is this sort of rebounding, you know, back to, where we started, um, and you know, we're curious to sort of hear from uh, families and individuals, you know, what their, you know, what their sort of final choice um, in disposition will, will be. So, Greg, one of the other questions I had, um, you know, in your exploration of cemeteries. Um, do you find that people don't fully understand how cemeteries have shaped uh, you know, history and the human experience? Yes, and that's why they should all read this book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, and th that was really kind of the point of it. Uh, the, the, the book itself, really, I try and make the cemetery the protagonist, uh, as some people who I do creative writing with might, might um, be familiar with me saying, and basically every chapter is is about each cemetery. It's not necessarily about the people who are buried there, but about how these cemeteries either reflect who we are, or in some ways played a role in uh, in changing American history. And so it, it talks about the desecration of indigenous people's graves and um, the segregation of the dead in the South that continues today, uh, and the pop culture of cemeteries and that sort of thing. And so yeah, I think that uh, people, obviously, um, I was inspired to write this book in order to kind of tell this story about this Forrest Gump of, of history here with cemeteries just showing up in these different places. And uh, I really try and, and, and not focus on death per se that much really in, in the language. So it's all about these places springing to life and being reborn and, and um, using words like that teeming with whatever, you know, so that um, it's really, uh, it portrays things in a different perspective, because as you know, like Mount Auburn, Mount Auburn is this place that's just bursting with life. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. And so I, I try and kind of with humor and without being too morose, sometimes a little gross, I do admit <laughs> that, um, tell this kind of entertaining story about this, this other side to um, really a story about us through the lens of cemeteries.
But it, inevitably, then, you know, I'm uh, still newish to the world, but there are people who were just like, you know, this kind of, like, I, I don't go there, right? So yeah. I, would, I would never go to a cemetery unless I had to. Right. How do you think, um, you know, are those people convertible to, like, oh, yeah, this is a place for life, or? Uh, uh, <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> but, um, and that's, that, that's what makes this so fascinating, is that, or to me, the research that I did for this was that um, it is so untouched by, um, by historians, by um, sociologists, by researchers, by, by even environmental researchers, to, to be honest. Um, so you might want to read Slate on Monday morning. Um, perhaps you'll see an article in there about that. But um, um, just to give another shameless plug. But <laughs> um, and so so really, there's so much to be told. Uh, and like that, the, the the New York Times review that that uh, was quoted at the beginning, that was kind of the, the gist of what the what the reviewer said, who was a historian. She said, you know, wow, I never realized these treasure troves that are right there that that have so much, that, that record so much of our history right there for us to look at. Or these treasure troves of art, or, or horticulture, or landscape. Um, and, and yeah, so I think that if people, my hope is that if people's eyes are open to that, they will, they will realize um, how much of the historical record are found in these places. Oh, and one uh, final last question, I think we have time for questions. Think very carefully about your answer to this question. <laughs> so if you had to choose... I'm not favorite, doing mulch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. If you had to choose your favorite cemetery in front of a Cambridge crowd here, <laughs> what cemetery would you choose? Mount Auburn. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> Is an amazing place. Greenwood Cemetery, which was inspired by uh, Mount Auburn uh, in Brooklyn, New York, was really the inspiration for Central Park. Uh, Greenwood, they uh, was so popular, uh, people from around the world would come and, and visit Greenwood that they, they, the city planners had this idea. They're like, well, why don't we build this like Central Park that's like Greenwood but doesn't have dead bodies? <laughs> and, and, and that's basically how Central Park was created. Um, but I also love, like I mentioned before, Hollywood Forever Cemetery because uh, there's this awesome statue of Burt Reynolds there. <laughs> um, and it is a, it, it's this great place where there are like um, peacocks running around and it's palm trees oh, yeah. and the, the, some of the memorials are really gaudy, but that makes them beautiful. Mm -hmm. And people go there and they, there are park benches that are, that are memorial stones that people sit on and read books. And, Johnny Ramone is there, and there's a big statue to him, and they have like a Johnny Ramone film festival every year, and they have this massive Day of the Dead. But I'll, I'll just I'll cut it short with one last thing. But the, there is one cemetery that means a lot to me. Uh, now that I live in, Wil uh, in Middletown, Delaware, um, I run with a running group on Saturday mornings. One Saturday morning a month, we run along um, the river in Wilmington, Delaware, and there is a uh, potter's field that is uh, along the the running or the, the bike path and the only way to get to it is by the bike path it's next to a, a women's prison but it was a state potter's field until it filled up with 900 graves a few years ago and each grave is marked it's just a small cement post and each grave is just marked with a number uh, for each of the people buried there and uh, it's just a very meaningful place I go there when I whenever I run and I stop and I walk through there and uh, I, I mentioned this this morning on a radio interview that I did but um, I, I'd like to pause there for just a moment and uh, in some small way try and give agency to these people through my thoughts that perhaps they didn't get in life. And so, of all the burial grounds, I think that's, to me right now, that's the most meaningful. I hope you're with us near or far.